The headlines are big and the issues complicated. The war in Ukraine is lasting longer than anticipated. The killing and dying continue with no sign of letting up, really. Peace negotiations are monstrously fiddly things. For the moment, it seems the war will continue or the war will end, according to the dictates of one man. We, we gather in our little clusters to share the wealth of repetitive reporting we've heard, and some of us become sudden experts on the topic of the day. I must confess to being utterly jaded at this point. Is it possible for me to think the worst about the world's movers and shakers and the worst about the news media? There are a few places in all of these episodes of unalloyed tragedy where we hear something pure, something genuine. The captured Russian soldiers calling their mothers, the Ukrainian young men, students last month, soldiers this week calling their mothers, a husband and father no longer speaking about the family he has lost, an elderly woman crossing a bridgeway of wobbly planks where a modern reinforced concrete bridge once stood but has been demolished by army engineers. Amid politicians making pronouncements, pictures of armored fighting vehicles being struck by rocket-propelled grenades and hospitals collapsing following bomb strikes, the attempts of the people trapped in the jaws of conflict to make contact with their loved ones is the only truth, the only genuine truth. These are urgent calls. Urgent calls certainly, as close to pure love as anything I've heard from this pathetic and tragic mess. Not going to solve the Ukraine war, but there are urgent calls, urgent calls that come to us down through history. How will they speak to us? Well, what do you say? Let's walk through these doors and let's worship God. A blessed good morning to you one and all, and welcome to Drexel Hill United Methodist Church this third Sunday in Lent. Let's begin now our worship together by joining in the call to worship. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. Jesus ready stands to save you for 
Let us join now together in our invocation for the morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we move now to our service of confession, I say to you we know ourselves to be a broken people, separated from ourselves, others, and the Lord of life. Let us then confess our brokenness together. You, O Lord, have called us to watch and pray. Therefore, whatever may be the sin against which we pray, make us careful to watch against it, and so have reason to expect that our prayers will be answered. In order to perform this duty aright, grant us grace to preserve a sober, equal temper, and sincerity to pray for your assistance. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us, in one voice, receive our pardon, saying, Thanks be to God. And now, dear sisters and brothers, let's offer one another signs of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us join now together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, You shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, 
the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And the gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. We are not going to find a gospel lection more appropriately Lenten or characteristically Lucan than our text for today. The entire passage is an urgent call to repentance, a turning from sin and a reformation of action and attitude. The theme of repentance occurs more in Luke than in the other New Testament writers. Pilate mingles Galileans' blood with their sacrifices. Late breaking news. Tower of Siloam falls on 18 in Jerusalem. Film at 11. Luke describes Jesus responding to headlines, reporting political murder and natural disaster with a deliberate double message. Jesus asks rhetorically, were they worse sinners than all the rest? No. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. There's at least uh, two temptations here. One is to blame the victims. If they're suffering, they must have sinned. And so we distance ourselves from them. Jesus won't allow this move. They were no more sinful than anyone else. Now, the second temptation, the second temptation is everything's random. Nothing means anything 
it don't mean nothing. There's no connection between our sin and God's action in the world. Now, Jesus won't allow that kind of inference either. There is a reckoning, but since God's ways and thoughts are not our ways and thoughts, we err both when we assume God always punishes sin with disaster and when we assume that God never does. Jesus' parable about the fig tree refuses to resolve that tension. God's unaccountable mercy provides additional time for repentance. The door is open <laughs> for a while. Yet there will be a reckoning. A human presumption can push even God's patience too far. Jesus' disciples are forever freed from the ancient notion that prosperity and good health are evidence of divine favor, whereas poverty and suffering are clear signs of divine wrath. Even so, the idea persists. It's alive in our world today. That great American writer, Thornton Wilder, in his novel, The Bridge at San Louis Ray, there's a priest who's trying to prove that the reason a bridge collapses is because of the moral flaws of the people who were on the bridge who perished when it collapsed. Of course, the priest's efforts fail. Jesus rejects such attempts at calculation, not simply because they are false, but because they miss the vital point. Everyone is to live in trust before God without linking loyalty to God to life's sorrows or joys. Repent or perish? Hm. God will forgive my sins, was German poet Heinrich Heine's deathbed quip. It's his job! <laughs> How different are the viewpoints of Isaiah, Paul, and Luke? They note an ongoing theological tension between the assurance of God's kindness and the call to immediate repentance. Yes, God is merciful, not punishing as we deserve, not automatically correlating our misdeeds with disasters. But there is no room for complacency either. If we think we are standing, we should watch that we do not fall. God, in Isaiah, uh, is gracious and has an invitation to everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. There is no admission charge. Imagine a feast where the poor receive special invitations. Blues singer Esther May Scott reworked a Beatles song a few years ago into a gospel theme, and she sang, God don't care too much for money, money can't buy his love. But then, there comes God's challenge for discernment. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Three times we're told to listen. Listen to what? To the deliberately double message of assurance and a call to repentance. First, the promise, I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Then the warning, seek the Lord while he may be found. God 
is available now, but we may not presume that God will always be available. We sinners must act quickly while the door is open, while mercy and pardon are offered in abundance. For who knows the thoughts and ways of God? which are as high above ours as the heavens are high above the earth. The first danger in spiritual complacency, any who assume they have advanced beyond temptation should think again. There is also danger in granting too much power, even glamour, to temptations. Temptation is common, says Paul, and also avoidable, thanks to God's mercy. There is, as he says elsewhere, no excuse, since God, who is faithful, will not allow us to be tested beyond our strength. With the temptation also comes the way out. It might just be the perfect reflection for Lent, these lessons today. Whether we seek to understand the motivations of a Russian dictator or people closer to us, we should underestimate neither the reality of temptation nor the power of God. God bless you in keeping a holy Lent. Amen. As we move now to our sending forth, I say to you, to live is to risk and to care. We are ready to live for all humankind. Life is mission. We choose to be set. And now, as you have been gathered in from the world to hear the gospel proclaimed, I send you back now into that same world to tell of the living Christ. And take this benediction with you, God the Creator, God the Redeemer, God the Sustainer, be with you now and remain with you evermore. Amen. Amen.